There's only, there was four shawls along here. And when I speak of shawls, some of them were large like this or small like this. Some were even smaller, little rooms, what we used to call steeples. <coughs> and it was very, very important. Now, round us, as you see, you've now got the Moss Complex. And I tell you what, they're fantastic people. We really have. We've got a wonderful association with them in every conceivable way. No, no arguments with them at all. They respect us, we respect them. It's really lovely. In fact, in about half hour's time, we should hear the man calling to prayer. Okay. Round us, as I say, is a complex. Just visualise it as tenements running from one end of Philgate Street <coughs> to the other end. Nothing but tenements. And the shamus or the beadle going by over the morning. Oi, you're during shul. Oi, you're during shul. It's nice, my day off. Get to shul. So they were never short of a minion, a, a quorum in this shul. Never, ever nor were any of the other shows, because when you had 400, believe me, you had the congregations to meet. Now this show is built on the lines of an Eastern European show. During the war it got badly, badly damaged, and what was left was really the four pillows that you can see. The rest of the show was so badly damaged that it took quite a bit of rebuilding. And what with the reparations from the government and money raised by Mr. Nathan Zlotnicki, committee at that time, a massive committee, they rebuilt this shore between the 1950s and 1960s. And as I said, it was built on Eastern European in style. Now what I mean by that is, if we go back to Poland, Russia, Lithuania, at that period of time, in between, say, the 1850s to 1900s from that period, when they were dogging in shores, they weren't allowed shores in towns. <coughs> Beg your pardon. Their shoes with the steeple, steeple, outside, right on the edge. They weren't allowed big buildings. Much to, much to which you will not be told. They were only allowed wooden buildings. They couldn't have candles, no kerosene, certainly no electric light, no gas light. Makes you wonder how they're going to read the laws, doesn't it? See, the prayers, like all of us, as we grow up, we know most of the prayers automatically. We know the Shema, we know the Amida, we know other, uh, <coughs> other certain prayers <coughs> which we don't actually need a sitter for. Some of the main prayers we do. But when it comes to reading the Torah, big difference. The Torah is not written as your sitter, as your prayer book. It's just lines of letters, no punctuation, no demarcation where chapter starts and chapter finishes. Not nothing like that. So how are we going to read it? We need a special man. But more so, because there's no punctuation, how's he going to read it? With all the lights off, with no light at all. These people in Eastern Europe had a fantastic idea. They put fan lights in, in their roof. All the lights off here. Don't worry, I could get Philip, Mr. Philip Resnick over there, up there, to intone the Shema and the Amida without the book, and he'd be able to read it quite perfectly. The same with the Torah. I could put that on the oil up there on the desk, and it can be intoned because we do not need the electric light. And that was the beauty of it when this was conceived. Now these gentlemen thought of this all these years ago, 1950. Many of us think modern, modern way of thinking, electric lights, etc. When I first went to shore, and I was not religious at the time when I got married, we used to have what we used to call Shabbos Koi. We used to use them regularly in the east end of London. My sons did have one. I wonder how many of us realised that it wasn't correct. But it's all wrong to have a shop as mine. Just think what it says. The Torah tells us you, your maidservant, or your handsome. Hmm. And you're paying for somebody to come and switch on your lights. I don't know, in Vine Court at that time, rather laughable, we used to go out and we found what we used to call the down and house, we used to live over at Grant House. 
Do you want five wood pines or five weight cigarettes that are no longer in existence? Yes, come in a minute, switch that one and we'll give it five weights of wood pines. Come back this evening, switch them off and get another five weights of wood pines. <laughs> we were never short of people doing these type of things for us. And it was always an accepted factor. And that is the beauty of jury, that we can move on, we move forward, we argue, we disagree, things like that. Now we had here the most fantastic, really, really fantastic, of all the reverence that I have ever known, and believe me, I've known some. You would walk down Whitechapel High Street, and you walk on <coughs> when it was really a Jewish area, and you said to somebody, <coughs> I'm looking for Mr. Gale. Pardon? Yeah, I'm looking for Mr. Gale. No. You go on to another store and you ask the same question. You walk to 20 stores and you ask that question, but nobody knew him. Nobody knew him. Man didn't exist. No, Mr. Gale didn't exist. Labish existed. Labish Gale. He existed. He more than just existed. Everybody knew him. From the kids, to the grandparents. Nobody ever knew him as a reverent Labish player, I assure you. Nobody. Apart from when we were in a committee meeting at the Federation, and he would be referred to as a reverent Labish player. Labish. And the kids, my, my children, and other children, grandchildren, only ever knew him as Uncle Labish. And he was set up there in the corner. I can see him now in his white kittle with his young girl on, and a big gentleman, a really big gentleman. And the kids would come in. They wouldn't run down to their parents, grandparents or grandfathers, uncles. Oh, no. Uncle Labish was the first point of call. And when they spoke to Uncle Labish, they could go and see whoever they liked. That was the difference. That was the respect that that man got or gave to the children. When, we, when he died in 1992, we lost the diamond in the crowd. They talked about the diamond. <coughs> He was bigger than the Corinor diamond. He was more expensive, more necessary than the Corinor diamond. He was a man you could look up to. I stood up there, and I stood beside him one day, and somebody said, "Gone who it was, it doesn't matter. So and so and so and so has just driven up in his car. And Labour's blessing was dovening, and he stopped. And he looked at the man, and he said to him, What are you doing? He said, I'm in short. He said, We'll carry on dovening. That was like, he didn't care. He, it wasn't like he didn't care. It wasn't his business to judge. He said, if I was made to be a judge, I'd have been given a week. I said, but I wasn't. He was an upright man, a religious man. A man you could take your troubles to, a man who would tell you, tell you right from wrong, who led his children right, whose son, Jack showed him with my president. He died two years ago. I lost a wonderful friend in him. I was his vice president. I'm now the honorary life vice president here. And you know, I get such joy coming here. To me, this is not, not a hard work. I just love it. I love seeing everybody in here. You know, it, to me, this is when the show is alive. It comes alive. When, you know, if there's no people in the show, all you've got is a room. You make it worthwhile. You make coming to show so worthwhile that, you know, it's not a, not a chore, it's a pleasure. You know, I enjoy, I'll be here for another, possibly another four or five hours, three, four hours. I don't consider that any hard work at all. It's just sheer, sheer enjoyment for me to be here. Little tricks that you'll notice around. You see, this side, you see all the donations up here. Loads and loads of donations, plenty of money put into the shawl by various people. Most of it, uh, I'm trying to find a smaller map up there. Yeah, there is one. Fisher, if I look across at Fisher, and felt that under there. Uh, seven pounds, seven shillings. For the uninitiated, seven pounds, 35 pence. Because I'm talking in guineas now, I know. Not so it's seven pound thirty-five. <coughs> when you realise that seven pound thirty-five is possibly two to three weeks' wages, you spend more than that just going to pictures, don't you? How much ice cream costs you in pictures? 
Come on. Oh, no, no. Come on, have a choice cream cross. How much? Four, four pounds. Uh, seven pounds, isn't it? Well, <laughs> 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 they're really stupid. You're tubs anymore. They don't know where we're going. It's terrible. You're being robbed. <laughs> anyway, to come back to that. No, they gave those donations. They gave them we lend it. And they said, we'd like it put up. So, okay, so we engaged the songwriter. <clears throat> but we didn't pay the songwriter. You wanted it put up. You paid the sign writer as well. So you paid your seven guineas, or your seven pound thirty-five, and the sign writer wanted another pound, so it's now cost you eight pound thirty-five. But you didn't argue about it, so it was a good way round it. Now, all our all our members here are all welcome. Unfortunately, we're a very, very aging community. Uh, I'm not gonna say we're dying on our feet, we're not. The heart's still going very, very strongly. Limbs don't move so easily as they did, but the heart's still working very hard. We come down here and thoroughly enjoy it. So Philip will tell you when he comes here the what it feels like to come into a shore, which is a family. And it is a family. It's very, very important to us. I dog in another shore during Shabbos. I know we're here on the Shabbos. This shore is open once a month. We get our minion here. Well, that, I should say, they get a minion here. Sometimes I can be here sometimes. On. Of the Yontavim, Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, unfortunately I would have to be done in another shul where I'm in Walden. Uh, I know that they will be well, have enough people here to look after them. I know it will be well covered. I know it will be beautifully dotted. I'm now really looking forward to September the 24th. It's just before Rosh Hashanah. Show us. 24th. I should be here at 11 o'clock at night. It's a Salihan service. It's a preparation towards Rosh Hashanah when we ask for penitence. Now, for the first time in I think 30, 40, could be 50 years, there'd be a Salihan service in the East End of London. 